but, but there were other examples where the users were driving it. The second thing I want to say is up to three weeks ago, um, I had agreed to give this uh, lecture. I was the one of the Leo people responsible uh, for the computer at Fort Avery. Um, but I had no material. Uh, I had written a paper about this in 1960. I could find no trace for it, and neither could Google. Google usually is very good, but on this occasion I couldn't find anything. So I found myself in the situation that I had to rely on a very fallible memory. Um, when I went back to my office at the LSE and searched through some files, I found this particular document, and that included the paper I had written in 1960, and I was saved. Then to, on top of that, um, <coughs> Cliff Dilloway, Cliff, can you just stand up? Cliff, Cliff Dilloway, um, an old time Ford employee from Ford's own name at uh, Dagenham, wrote a report in 1960 for the Ford Motor Company on the application which I'm going to talk about and on how to replace it with a more up to date computer. So I had a 60 page report, so suddenly I had my own paper from 1960 and his paper from 1960, so I had a surface of material. So I'm going to be talking for the next three hours about <laughs> <laughs> the Ford Avery computer. The switch is there. Right, thank you. So I'm going to talk, give first of all a little bit of introduction and background, then talk about the requirements which had to be met, then go on to talk about the particular computer, the Leo 2, the configuration of that, something about the job organization, some conclusions, and some references, which will include some of the references uh, you were talking about. Now, the first strange thing, we have to think about that in the mid 1950s, the Ford Motor Company bought a computer, ordered a computer from a tea shop company. And that is perhaps a little bit surprising. Why should a major company for in the automotive business go to Lyons to buy a computer? And there's a reason behind that. First of all, there was mutual respect and esteem. Janet Delph has talked about Simmons and his influence. He was by that time the head of the president of the Office Managers Association. And um, Ford had a thriving old end department under a man called Bradley. And Bradley was a member of the same association, so they knew each other already well and there was a mutual esteem. So there was a recognition that Lions were in some ways as far as information as an organization method was concerned, as far as systems analysis was concerned, something special. And so they did the first thing was to ask Lyons to do the Ford Motor Company payroll as a service job, one of the first examples of outsourcing in the world of a major uh, commercial operation, uh, to do their payroll uh, on the Leo computer at uh, Cadby Hall. And the program uh, started in 1955, the successful launch of that program in 1955. So, Ford had some experience that Leo could do the job. And that was the very most important thing. Now, Ford had a spare parts depot. I don't think it's in existence anymore, Cliff. Do you know? I don't know, but I, I think, think it still is. You think it might be. Anyway, at the time, in the mid-1950s, this was a state-of-the-art supply uh, depot. It supplied something like, it held something like 45,000 distinct stock items. Many of those, a vast number of those, dated for vehicles long out of date. They included some stock from, of Model T parts. And if you think of when the Model T first came on, uh, first became uh, available, 1912 I think it was, uh, you can see that there were some very old parts. But you might wonder, how many people were driving Model T's? And the answer is not very many. But the 
engines from these Model Ts were still used in pumping equipment. So there were some old industrial pumps using Model T parts. And it's for those that the uh, stock was being held. Ford claimed that he could provide spares for any Ford Motor Corvette of whatever age, and this, as I say, included the uh, Model T. The scale of business was very large. By the standards of what, uh, what we saw then, there were 30,000, 40,000, 5,000 stock items, 30,000 stock movements per day. 30,000 stock movements on about, of the whole range of 45,000, perhaps 12,000 were active each day. So, by any kind of scale, this was a fairly massive operation. Now, up to the time they owned the computer, uh, and here we may say, okay, it didn't need a computer to run it. It was being run successfully in a fashion before that. Uh, the data processing was run efficiently on unit record equipment, um, and a guy called Stan Woods was the manager, and he really knew his punch cards. He could make things work on punch cards. And that's, again, a, a special skill. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, the management realized that uh, for competitive advantage or to maintain their position in the marketplace, uh, they required improved service and lower costs. And they felt, or they worked out, gladly, and the O&M team worked out that uh, a computer would be able to do that. So the scale wasn't quite an application looking for uh, an app, computer looking for an application, but they found an application for which a computer would perhaps serve. After the experience of the payroll and the visit uh, to uh, Leo by Ford's, Ford UK's managing director, an order was placed in 1956 for what was then the fourth Leo II. The first one had gone to Leo itself, the second one went to uh, Wills, the third one to uh, uh, Stuart and Lloyds, and the fourth one went to Ford. So this was a, a pre-core store machine. Later Leo tubes had core stores. This one didn't. It was still a Mercury delay line uh, machine. Quite, a, quite a, a small machine. It was purchased in 1956 for £125,000. Planning work started immediately. And by the time the computer was delivered in December 1958, much of the planning and programming had already been carried out. So uh, by the time the computer was delivered, we were ready, they were ready. Ford and Leo, which were contributing to this, were ready. Ford had built up their own programming team, but a great deal of the initial work uh, was done by John Gosden, the late John Gosden. You remember he, uh, he was a major Leo figure in Leo. And at the subsequent stage, I took over from him. But the most important step which was taken by the Ford Motor Company was to hire Peter Ginchor. Some of you may know Peter Ginchor. He's a figure perhaps a little bit larger than life. Um, he uh, was hired. He had taken philosophy at university. He had thought of becoming a priest. And I'm quite sure if he'd become a priest, he would by now be an archbishop. Uh, he was the one who, who Stan Wood's expertise in the punch card processing, managed to blend those two ideas to uh, produce the way the job was run and to manage the actual implementation. Gosden had played a major part in the first job, how to, how to build the job in the first instance. Peter Gingell realized that he made it, made it work. Uh, the project's success was an enormous amount to his skill and enthusiasm. Uh, later, Peter joined uh, Leo Computers and headed the Leo operation in Australia, where he's now, as a private consultant. Though so I suspect that some of us getting near retirement. Or sort of retirement. <laughs> Let's look at the requirements. First of all, we have the spare parts. And these are divided into two main categories, tractor parts and auto parts. The people who could, there, was also, uh, there were also some parts were reserved for export trade. 
and some parts could have partially export trade. So there were, there were uh, the, the way the stock was divided, each, each item of stock could be a tractor or motor or both, export or domestic or both. And there were different rules applied to the way orders were treated according to these categories. Many of the older parts, for example, the uh, Model T parts, I've said this already, were not used in vehicles, but they used still in service industrial engines. The thing depended on a tight-knit dealership network. The dealers were divided into two kinds. The retail dealers, which are the ordinary garages on the roundabout, of which there were hundreds of thousands, and the relatively few, three to four hundred, main dealers. It's main dealers who actually supplied the retail dealers. So Averly traded with a mis miscellaneous set of export uh, orders and the tightly controlled dealership network. And controlled uh, through such a, in such a way that the highest discounts were given for orders placed on a regular basis. And each dealer, each main dealer, was expected to place a main stock order comprising perhaps several hundreds of thousands of parts on a monthly basis on a specified day of the month. And if the dealer met that, then that dealer got a relatively high discount. And then there were a series of orders below the level of the main uh, stock order with different degrees of urgency, with the highest degree of urgency applied to an order which was called an immobilized vehicle order, or in the case of export, an air freight order where it was directly freighted out, and where the order had to be serviced on the day the, uh, the order arrived. So it arrived in the morning, it, had to, it was expected to go out that same day, if it were available in stock, which is not always true. <coughs> now, the main dealers were themselves franchised to have to be uh, auto dealers or tractor dealers, though some main dealers, particularly in country districts, had both franchises. They were separately franchised. Tractor parts could be ordered by, only by dealers with tractor franchises and so on. Um, but these franchise arrangements did not apply to export orders, where a different set of rules applied. Mm -hmm. I've talked about the supplementary orders and the sliding skirts. Um, orders which could not be met from stock were back ordered, and so that we had to we had to maintain a notion of what was back ordered. And as stock arrived, it had to be allocated to stock orders according to the priority of the orders which were back ordered. So there were a fairly complex set of rules which defined when a dealer could actually get the, or the, the goods he's ordered. Supplies were received from uh, Ford's own factories and from a large range of uh, outside suppliers, ranging from huge companies like Lucas and CAV to much smaller companies providing uh, special, special items, niche items. Stock control and order allocation was based on a series of rules framed in a variety of ways. For each stock item, the reserve stock was calculated based on past requirements. And for different items, the rules were different. They were not, uh, they were not uh, the same for every item. Fast moving items of the 45,000, 9,000 were regarded as fast moving had different rules to less frequently ordered parts. Stock was allocated according to the type of order. A stock order had the lowest priority and could not take the stock below its reserve level. On the other hand, an immobilized vehicle order could take the stock to could take what stock there was available. Parts was a complicated system of part numbering. Uh, stock items were known by their part number, and there were three different numbers in use. The first number was the number in the catalog which was the old Ford part number, a, a large alphanumeric number, um, 
which dated back to the historical times and was based on the particular industrial uh, uh, part of the uh, factory where they were built. There was a second one which defined the location of the item in the stores. So this was the store was a rectangular store with corridors, uh, with, uh, corridors and the bin numbers were allocated a serial number according to the gangway they were in. So big A was a lateral um, gangway, small A was a, uh, horizontal, uh, the other way, and uh, the number then uh, defined exactly where the items were located. In theory, that is as long as the items were where they were supposed to be. So there was a matching which had to be done mm -hmm. with, is this item, which we've called item number according to its location, actually the same one that is described in the catalogue. That was a problem, a physical problem for the people in the store. Um, finally, a new serial number was allocated for the data processing. So there were the three numbers, the location number, the uh, uh, original part number, and the uh, uh, computer number. What were the requirements? First of all, to update the uh, stock received, record with respect to goods received. We, we know they can come from several things. The first thing is the stock was uh, received. As soon as stock was received, it had to be allocated against previous black orders. Then each item which was freshly ordered had to be chopped and had to, uh, checked for entitlement. Did the dealer have the appropriate franchise? And so on. To check that stock is available to meet the order and to create a back order, uh, order or not. Again, the rules are safe for different uh, items of stock were complicated. To check on stock levels and report an action needing to, ta to, uh, to be taken such as reorders. To prepare picking, packing, dispatch, and invoicing documentation. All in different sequences, of course. The picking documents had to be in bill number order. The um, invoices had to be in in the order, in the part number order, within dealers, and the dispatch information had to be, again, in a slightly different order. Uh, to maintain the dealer's personal account, to provide a comprehensive sales analysis, to calculate monthly sales forecasts, and to schedule stock replenishments. So it was fairly integrated total job, which was required. Now let's have a look at the computer, which had to deal with all that. First of all, it was a Leo 2, as we've already said. There were 2,048 words of storage, each of 19 bits, including the sign. The input comprised three independently buffered channels linked to card readers, each card reader operating at 200 cards a minute, giving a total input rate of 600 cards a minute. One of the novel features of the Leo at this time, as against some of the machines used for more uh, technical purposes, was the multiple channels, the multiple channels which allowed simultaneous input and output on a fairly large scale. Output three, output consists of three independent buffer channels linked to two card punches providing 200 cards uh, per minute because the punching rate was only 100 cards a minute as against the reading rate of 200 cards a minute. And that marvel, the power samasonic printer. Some of you may remember the power samasonic printer. Yes, I can see places uh, the, the web where you power samasonic printer providing 300 lines a minute. And I think it's fair to say uh, Ernest, Ernest uh, K here is one of the original designers of Leo. It, it's fair to say that the Samsonic uh, caused a few problems in linkage. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and to make it work was a piece of genius. Okay. <laughs> so, by modern standards, what I have in my ear now, uh, a digital hearing aid, contains more computing power, I suspect, than that, <laughs> than that uh, Leo two. But that certainly wasn't something which was looking for an application. <laughs> so, in 
So we see limitations from the computer configuration made it impossible <coughs> uh, to meet all the requirements in one line. We had no random access, we had no magnetic tape. So we had to do the job, and this is the, I think, the clever thing, is to utilize the punch card facilities, card punches, collators, and so on, for parts of the job, and blend those in with what the computer could do best. But really the skill of John Gorston, uh, Peter, Peter Gangel, uh, Stan Woods, and I have to add myself into to a certain extent, is in trying in making that blend work. That's really the uh, thing. Of course, there were other people all over the world who may have been doing similar things, but we weren't copying anybody. We were developing ourselves. Everything we did, we did de novo. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's perhaps uh, to our credit. And I suspect that's exactly true of what, uh, what the first speaker was talking about. Many of those jobs were totally new and uh, new. Without random access, sequence determined job organization. Sequence, that's bin number or part number sequence. Bin number sequence for stock control and picking lists. Part number sequence within dealer number for dealer document production. The size of war was that <coughs> export processing was carried out separately from domestic processing. Couldn't do them all at once, so the export orders was outsorted and dealt with certain play. The timing of outputs, these meant that the job was organized into daily, weekly, and uh, monthly runs with year end uh, experts. As we can imagine, to do all that in, on that computer took 24 hours. So the computer then three shifts, it, uh, it was on all the time. Records were kept on 18-column uh, cards, and there were several of these. The major one was the stock balance card. That was the main record, the database of, uh, of the system. And this was punched in two ways. It had a part serial number, which was punched in alpha decimal, in the way one sort of sorted. But it also had the rest of the information punched in binary, across in rows. So the card was the card. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the ingenuity. <laughs> the ingenuity. <laughs> uh, stock available, quantity on back order, export orders deferred, um, forecast demand for one month, actual demand for this month, domestic, actual demand this month, export, goods received this month, stock control indicator, uh, to say what kind of part it is, and procurement source code. Where did the uh, thing come from? So we had this card punching in the, in the two in the two way. <coughs> and the second important thing was the movement card. And again, fiendishly clever stuff. If one thought of it now, one wouldn't dream of doing things this way anymore. The movement card, part serial number, bin number, part number, domestic price, export price, selling units, cost price, sales analysis code. And this was all punched in alpha decimal and interpreted. And it formed the basis of both the input and the actual uh, processing. What happened is that these cards, for each part in a large pulling file, there were cards, and girls went round with each dealer's order. Don't forget, an order, a single stock order, could have several thousand items on it, or several hundred or several thousand items, and pulled cards from this stack for each part. They then went through <coughs> punching and verifying to add on the quantities ordered, the dealer number, and things like that. And then, the, from the main pack, the uh, items which had moved were outsorted and collated against the, well, we collated the movement cards against the stock cards to pull out the ones which had moved. So that we actually processed only those which had moved. So out of the 45,000, we actually processed those 12,000 or, or uh, who had moved. And we created as a result of this run a variation card, which showed any stock, stock adjustments which had to be made. 
so that one could, could then feed those back in uh, next time around. These then, uh, the cards were then resorted and used for producing the documentation. And this produced the documentation now. On the, uh, all this would proceed in the morning, the cards were pulled and processed during the day, the main run was during the night, and by the morning the picking lists were ready for the, uh, for the factories. So it's a pretty smart turnaround on what was less than I've got in my ear. Uh, I've said most of that. Between 1,500 and 2,000 invoices were produced each day. Each invoice, of course, covering several hundred items scale. Uh, all this was seen by first post in the morning, where post is doing the day and the necessary documentation is that produced for the next working day. Some quick conclusions. The system represented a sensible mix of computer and unit record operations, using each to the best of its capability. And it's that blending which I think made this system work on a daily basis, possibly. Possibly work on a daily basis in a regular fashion. And the level of ambition, given the limitations of the computer by today's standards, was commendably high. Do an integrated job of this kind. The implementation went more or less uh, to plan, and the bulk of the requirements were met as first stated. Inevitably, there were some compromises, but they were remarkably few, and there were things which had to be added on later in order to meet the full set of requirements. Nevertheless, uh, as a planning <coughs> obligation which was executed and uh, worked, and it's a credit to the particular team which followed built up that this actually worked that way. Nevertheless, um, by 1960, it was felt that the Leo uh, was running out of capacity and would be incapable of increasing volumes or um, stretched requirements. By then, too, computer equipment had advanced. As a result of that, Cliff Delaware there was, uh, was commissioned to write a report on the job and to recommend what future steps were taken, where it might be, might be taken. In the end, uh, the suggestion that the computer was to be replaced relatively quickly was not taken, and the situation was saved by, a, as I've only learned today uh, from Cliff, the situation was, was saved for uh, the Leo 2, in a sense, by changing the old unit record equipment for the most modern IBM unit record equipment which could do the unit record part of processing that much quicker. So the bottleneck, in a sense, had probably been not in the computer, which is remarkable, but in the way the total operation was handled with the unit record. So uh, that, that's how, to, how it finished off. Now, I'll finish off just with some very quick references. First of all, there's my own paper in here, Purchasing Office Association, talk given at Cranfield in uh, 1960 as part of a program of computers and purchasing and stores departments. And what is interesting here is that my, it's only one paper of several on applications then in process. That was in 1960. So covering that, again, that decade we were talking about uh, at the beginning. There were several of these things already going. Secondly, there's Cliff Dillaway's uh, report, Requirements for Replacement Computer, for Motor Company Internal Report. Now, I'm mentioning both of those in a sense because they are really archive material, and it's important that we keep those. And Cliff, I hope we can find a way that, that they can, be, uh, can be, be part of the source of our history of computing. Then there's a book which uh, Janet mentioned, Peter Bird's, Leo the First Business Computer, published um, by Hessler Publishing Company. And I particularly want to refer here, it gives, for those who are interested, that book gives the technical details about the Leo II. Uh, I don't know all the, tech, can't remember all the technical details. They're all put down there on uh, page 217 to 219. 
for those who are interested. And finally, there is the book which uh, I, Dave Kemener, John Ayalis, Peter Herman, and myself edited, which gives a chronology of what happened in Leo, a, a, a first a superb account by David Kemener, and then reminiscences from various other people like myself, like my brother Ralph there, and uh, ma ma many other people, Peter Herman and so on, uh, which is a good book, which was published in the UK under the title of User-Driven Innovation. But that title wouldn't do for the Americans, so it was republished in America. It was called Leo, the incredible story of the world's first business computer. <laughs> I still prefer the older title, User-Driven Innovation, because that's what we are really talking about. Uh, and uh, with that, I can conclude this uh, particular talk. First of all, a family question. Yes. <laughs> you said uh, the Avery system will replace the system that will work. Yes. Supposing Ford had waited four years <coughs> instead of putting in that new application that you described, would that have been better for them? Um, Cliff, Pat, I don't know if you can answer that. I would say no. I think they could, this, this, this was a successful no, I, operation. I, I think they had to learn. And yeah. This is one of the things they learned on. The, uh, the Leo computer was in fact replaced by an IBM 1410. Uh, I can't give you a date for that, but it was a few years later than 1960. What happened when the computer broke down? Um, I can't. I can't give you a, an absolute answer because uh, I, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember the computer breaking down, but I'm quite sure it did break down. Um, I think. Uh, Not as often as the sound is strong. I think there was some slack in the system to permit a slightly later delivery, so there was a, it was it was held back. I'm not sure what happened about any mobilized vehicle orders. I suspect they were things when they happened, people went straight to the store and picked them. And variation cards were punched, some kind of movement card was punched to do that. I'm pretty sure this must have taken place, that would be the obvious way. But I have no documentary evidence of that. The Leo 2 Buell provided standby capacity to maintain more farms. In theory, but it would have been very, very difficult to implement because he didn't have to punch card air. It could have done some of the processing, but that would have been very difficult. I don't think it ever happened. My guess is that. Uh, certain orders, like immobilized people, orders were slid things laid out. Oh. There were on site engineers, of course. From the there were on site engineers, of course. 24 yes. hours a day. Yes. I, I seem to remember one of the things when I joined the computer industry in the late 60s was that what you had to do was to have a very comfortable engineer's facility at your particular site <laughs> with a television. <laughs> and that meant that the engineers tended to stay at your place until something went wrong and went somewhere else. So if anything went wrong, you had the engineers on site. And you had to provide coffee and a table and a couple of seats. Um, perhaps I could just ask a question of, Please. of Hugh. Um, you were talking about some of the early looking for applications. Uh, this may simply be a, a, a sort of <coughs> linguistic thing on the other side, but visiting the texture Museum in Berlin, um, they seem to suggest that Zuzu was, you know, sort of working on real applications with his electromechanical machines for the aircraft industry um, in the 1930s and 40s. Yes. So that in fact, we're, you know, there were things that were looking for some measure of automated computing power um, quite early on. Do you have any observations? But I noticed the comment things came from. The demands for computing uh, a century. Yeah. Yes. And the um, <coughs> point was that at the time when our computers were invented in the first ten years or so, I think the first five years, there was a substantial uh, capacity to do the calculations which were needed without computers. Yes. yes. Now this may have been true on the technical side, but certainly not true on the clerical side. That's a different matter. That's where, we, that's where the great difference lies, I suspect. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's a, just interesting that the, you know there was this development very early on with Zusa. Yeah, yeah. Doing oh yes, yes, but it, it, it did I, I suppose the classic example of a computer, though not a digital, not a store portable computer, was Colossus, which was built for one purpose only. Yeah. Um, I've got a few comments on what Hume was saying. Um, first of all, the earliest applications that were published, um, very few people published things you know, about the application. People talked, uh, published papers about the technical you know, chemistry or whatever, and then made a reference to uh, my friend Blank, who had done the computing for me. And probably the very first one of those must have been a paper by R.A. Fisher on some statistics, and he acknowledges the assistance of David Wheeler, who died a few weeks ago, uh, for solving some differential equations for him using the EDSAC computer. In fact, using uh, methods devised by Stanley Gill. Um, for that. Which had to be very carefully done because there was very little store and so you had to cut down a whole lot of things that was best if it was in particular places in the store because then one of the numbers that was used looked rather like an instruction. So you, you shouldn't have to do things like that. Um, you mentioned also about uh, where nobody was prepared to publish things. Well, from about 1956, uh, and I know that's slightly towards the end of your period, uh, there was the BCS bulletin, the computer bulletin, and from 1958 there was <coughs> the computer journal. And that was fairly yes. full of applications rather than theory. Um, secondly, you commented on, I think it was Karen Cotton who had done something, a whole so many things, and said, uh, the, the computer did these in 10 minutes, and previously I had taken something like three weeks, and he said, these are all therefore phony problems. Not quite so. Because if he had the problem, he had the program for this, he could solve the same problem with different data. And he would have taken in three weeks every time, and that having got the program, it would only take him 10 minutes. Um, and we could do that. Um, you commented about uh, digital, a digital computer to do some of the work of an analog computer. Well, yes, but there is a difference in speed. I was involved, I worked at RAE for a while, and they had built a huge analog computer where they could put actual parts of aircraft into the brothers and so on in this. Uh, and I had to write some of the programs, uh, some of the test programs, so that they would know whether they were right. And it took 20 seconds on the analog machine, and it took about three hours per run on reduce. In fact, there was a quite funny thing about it. Um, one of the things, it was something which was supposed to go along the beam, um, and it didn't. My calculations were that it wasn't where it was, and we looked at it, and suddenly, um, dawn of inspiration from the two chaps, the very senior RAE people, the Harry, we forgot gravity. <laughs> <laughs> um, and among just early applications, those of us who were in an installation that had a computer very early on, and I'm talking about some middle 50s, we were visited very frequently by high ups from all places, and we had to run some demonstration programs to show them this, that, and that. And of course, you showed them what the normal work of the installation was. Um, and we had little fun programs as well. And one of the very standard ones, an easy one you could explain what was happening, not how the computer did it, was a reaction time scale. Non reduce, you had a blank screen and the word now would appear, and you had to press the press a key and it would tell you how many milliseconds between the word now and you pressing the key, even if you had your hand on the key. And one day I'd been asked to look after these very senior people from the, uh, the Ministry of Supply, and we did all of this, and then we showed them this, and I said, We have found uh, that the first time you do it, your reaction time in milliseconds is, roughly speaking, 10 times your age in years. Nonsense, young man. Stand aside. Where do I have to press? Yeah. So we did it. And 
you know, the word now, he presses, and it says 505 milliseconds. <laughs> and he looked at me, absolute daggers drawn. <laughs> Damn you, young man. I'm 51, actually. <laughs> Design. Uh, the first, I mean, earlier appearance of the main design 
is a paper by von Neumann in uh, June 1945, which set out the general structure. Uh, he did that really invented himself, I think, but he put it together. Uh, so anywhere after that uh, was using uh, something that had already been invented. And of course, the Manchester machine was well, a splendid now. We've got great admiration for people. They got the first thing, machine going, first thing going uh, by something like a year in the whole world. But possibly a machine that could do uh, computing, people wasn't computing. You know, it, uh, it had about 100 of that, 200 bucks or more. The only way of putting the data in was on a row of 10 push buttons that have probably been cannibalized from the uh, split pass up the stores. The only way of getting data out is to copy, copy the dots down off a piece of paper. <laughs> so it's a great thing. It was the first computer I was doing uh, according to the B definition, and I have no great admiration for my friends there who did it, but, but they did invent the computer, and uh, it wasn't really a practical computer. I think the first practical computer actually doing really jobs that people wanted jobs done was in Cambridge about a year later. Anyway, there's one of these It's an interesting parallel, in fact, because the Wright brothers are the first people to fly, everyone says. Yeah. Uh, of course, what they couldn't do was to fly again. <laughs> <laughs> Rather like the computer, it took them a long time to get the second flight in. And uh, there is actually a letter from Orville Wright in, in a comment to a, a New Common Society paper in the 1920s saying how important Cayley's gliding experiments were to the fact that the Wright brothers knew what they were going to do when they got up there. <laughs> so I've been doing parallels all over, but, but Hugh, you had a, a, an observation on this. Yeah, I don't stand up myself. Uh, I've already taken the distinction between the necessity of certainly added to the flow of applications when they actually came into existence. But there were a number of questions. What were Ferranti doing in it in 1949 if they didn't think there was a business in it? What was English Electric doing if they didn't think there was a business in it? And your remark about three computers in the entire country, I think, was a little bit earlier. It was in the late 1940s rather than uh, during the 20s. John, do you have a question? service, uh, which is, must be very similar to Ford. If, if you'd have changed a few words, Frank, yes. that would have been exactly the presentation that you'd have given with the numbers, the part numbers, the pinging yeah, vests, yeah. they called it VOR by the way. Yeah. Um, and they did it on a, a Power Summers PCC yes. and the old 65 column Power Summers concrete bonk stuff. Yes. Um, but they're so similar that it's occurred to me to ask uh, who pinched the idea of who? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that we pinched each other's ideas because we didn't know what each other were doing, <laughs> by and large. Except perhaps through things like the Office Managers Association. I don't know whether the company you're talking to was a member of that. But uh, I think we took the logic of the situation, what we had available, and devised things. We were quite clever in those things. Very nice thing to argue. And so we, we I, I said, there were probably things like this taking place all over the world. But me only knew the one. Yes, I'd like to pick up on the words of my good friend here, George Davis, uh, um, about uh, <clears throat> disparaging remarks about the events of 1948 in Manchester. Uh, I don't think I've never heard anybody from Manchester say that they invented the computer. What they did, they proved a very basic principle that you could store data and program in the same, in those days it's called storage, and you could execute the program and you could perform a process on the data. Now that, if you happen to look at any of these computers that we have here, that basic principle has endured. 50 whatever many years later, 56 or whatever it is, it is still there. And that is really all they did. And indeed, it was, there, was a, there was a 50 year anniversary in 1998 to celebrate that. And this made it very clear. 
Yes. You know, that, that's yeah. really all it was. Nobody said, I don't know if this word was invented in a computer. That, that, that's quite, that's, 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 that's fighting talk. Sorry, George. I have to catch his name. I have to run. I have to go to that place. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to work one comment about uh, Ada in 1847 with the uh, analytical engine, her vision for using the girl and music, uh, wonder. Wow, there's so many different applications in the world. I think a lot of things, certainly in, in this area, where the idea of, you know, if we had a machine to do it, we could do this. Therefore, what does the machine have to look like? I mean, there, there were papers um, well before you know, the invention of mechanical calculations, so sort of saying, well, what we need to do is, is to do this. Um, the, the mechanic to Charles II, for example, realized that if you were going to build a mechanical calculator, it had to be able to add up farthings. You know, this sort of, this sort of thing. So that's what he, he did. He produced a machine that would, would add up money, because that was important. Thanks very much, Frank, for your presentation. You. And, uh, I hope you make it to Devon. I hope I make it to Devon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, well, in that case, uh, it, it only goes just as, as Frank disappears out the door putting his coat on to thank our three speakers for this afternoon and, and said a fascinating uh, afternoon. And, uh, you mean much. Uh, okay, great.